Um, welcome everyone uh, to this meeting. Um, I'm Julie Elliott. I'm one of the co-chairs of the uh, Britain-Palestine All-Party Parliamentary Group. And this afternoon's uh, briefing session is going to be on the consequences of Israeli human rights violations on the mental health of women in Gaza. And there is a report going to be published towards the end of July on this subject. We are being recorded today, so everything is on the record so that we can, uh, Carbu can um, put this uh, meeting online so more people and the people who are here today can have access to it. Um, so that's just for your information. We've got two speakers. And then after the speakers, we've got an opportunity for questions and answers. In terms of um, indicating that you want to speak, if you can put your hand up at any point during, uh, during the uh, briefing session, and then I will bring you in when we get to the question and answer part. Um, so we start off with Dana Moss. Dana has, has uh, done briefing sessions for us before, uh, for our all party group. She's the International Advocacy Coordinator at Physicians for Human Rights Israel, with a huge amount of experience um, in this area. So I'm going to bring Dana in first. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kabu, for, uh, for hosting. Um, apologies for background noise. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name's Dana. I work, as mentioned, at Physicians for Human Rights Israel, or PHRI. And I'm going to, to introduce PHRI and the Gaza Community Mental Health Program in a moment, but I first uh, wanted to share the words of uh, one of the Palestinian women from Gaza who told us her story, which is really representative of the interlinked and intergenerational nature of both human rights violations and trauma for Palestinian women in Gaza. Um, T is 48 years old. Um, I can't give her real name. Um, we'll refer to her as T. Uh, she is a cancer patient uh, from a refugee camp within Gaza. And I quote her. We are used to waking up to the sounds of bombings. I saw broken glass on my sleeping children's bodies several times. There is no security and there is always anxiety and fear of what might happen next. She continued. My husband's economic status has been markedly impacted. He used to work in Israel, but now he is sick and permits to work in Israel are being issued less frequently. As for my medical treatment, I have no gold left for it. T's house was partially destroyed uh, in the 2008 war. It was a house that was paid for when her husband had a job, uh, a job that he later lost as part of you know, the unemployment that resulted from Israel's blockade of Gaza. T and her husband and children moved in with her parents uh, and the house was later damaged in the 2021 Israeli assault on Gaza. Um, the kitchen was, uh, was damaged and the bathroom was damaged and the neighbors could then see them when they used the bathroom and they were forced to leave once again. T was then um, diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, there is a lack of available treatment options available in Gaza, partly as a result of Israel's development of the Palestinian healthcare system, and partly as a result of Israel's blockade um, and uh, the restrictions placed on what is termed as dual use items, uh, including you know, radio iodine therapy. Um, and uh, as a result of her financial situation, uh, T couldn't pay for treatment privately, um, and uh, she was forced to leave Gaza for medical treatment that was not available locally which then meant she had to endure the indignities of Israel's security irrigations, including uh, forcing her to unrobe. Um, and you know, we're talking about human rights violations, a number of human rights violations uh, and their own mental health impact. And all these things are very much intertwined. Uh, and T spoke in her interview uh, and you know, closed by saying, you know, I keep thinking about this, about the possibility that I would die, my husband would marry another woman, and my children would be in the same situation, facing the same problems. Our work in the Gaza Community Mental Health Program and Physicians for Human Rights Israel was through this project to reveal the political context of the mental health crisis in Gaza. Gaza is largely invisible to the international community, except during Israel's uh, periodic military assaults. You know, in the most recent one, you know, we know the data. 33 dead, 190 injured, nearly 3,000 housing units damaged. But our project explores what happens in the aftermath. What is the short and long-term trauma of this impact on Palestinian women? 
Gaza Community Mental Health Program is a nonprofit civil organization which was established in 1990 and it works in the fields of mental health and human rights. And it strives to improve the Palestinian community's mental health through providing clinical, social research and training uh, services. It also carries out advocacy for the rights of women, children, and victims of violence and human rights violations. Physicians for Human Rights Israel, or PHRI, is an Israeli human rights organization that focuses on the right to help of all those under the responsibility of the Israeli authorities, including Palestinians and OPT, which you know, we term as being under a regime of apartheid. We do humanitarian work through our mobile clinic. Uh, we have a monthly visit to Gaza, and we do advocacy vis-a-vis -vis local and international stakeholders, through legal petitions, public education campaigns, and media work. And for the past two years, we've been working on this project. Uh, now, Dr. Yasser Abu Jama, who is the Director General of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, is going to share our research findings, but essentially say you know, a couple of words on how we did it. So we, um, the, the, the research findings are based on a very uh, in-depth uh, study, a mixed method study to study the impact of the occupation on women in Gaza. So we had a survey that was developed by Palestinian uh, and Israeli human uh, mental health professionals. And we surveyed 424 adult women who had attended services either in the Gaza Community Mental Health Program community centers or in PHRI's mobile clinic. And we then followed these up with 19 in-depth interviews uh, conducted with the women who had scored uh, very highly for depression and anxiety within the survey. Uh, most of our participants were you know, aged 24 to 45, over half lived in camps, um, and reflective of the situation uh, in Gaza, uh, more than 90% you know, were unemployed and lived under uh, the poverty line. Um, and I, I'll, I think I'll take uh, let uh, Dr. Abu Jame take it from there and sort of delve into what we discovered through this, uh, through this research and also from his own you know, lengthy experience heading the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. Yes, Yasser, if, if you'd like to come in next, I'll just give you a brief introduction to everyone. Um, Yasser is a psychiatrist by training um, and um, is a member of the task force which developed the National Mental Health Strategy 2015 to 2019 in Palestine. And in, 19, in 2020, sorry, with a group of Palestinian mental health professionals, he co-founded the Palestine Global Mental Health Network, amongst many other things I've got in your biography. But Yasser, if you'd like to tell us about this piece of research, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, making the time and thank you, Kabu, for uh, organizing this uh, event. I hope that you'll find it uh, beneficial. Well, this uh, research finding is part of a two-year project, as Dana said, we, that is uh, supported by the EU. And part of it was to look into the psychological impact of the human rights violations, especially the right to health. Uh, so basically, we were like uh, having a couple of uh, uh, joint, if I could say, clinics. One would look into mental health and the other one would look into physical health. Physicians were coming from uh, Palestine 48, from Israel, in order to provide physical health to the uh, uh, people attending. And part of it was uh, professionals who were from GCMHP providing psychological uh, health. Uh, the idea was to look into the impact of the uh, human rights violations on the uh, health of women, whether that's a psychological impact or whether that's a physical uh, impact. Uh, as Dana said, we looked into more than 400 uh, uh, people, and those were women coming from the most marginalized areas, because the areas that were targeted were the most marginalized areas. Marginalized, we mean that areas that belong to the very eastern side, very northern side, and very southern side of the Gaza Strip. Now, I try to shortly present the main of the key findings, and I try to answer like three questions. And one is uh, what sort of human rights violations people talk about in, in Gaza Strip? Not all people, but those who were participating. The other question uh, would be, uh, how did that affect their mental health? And then, what are the main predictors? I mean, why it was such a huge effect on their mental health? If I'll start by talking about the most common, most frequent event that was reported 
by the participants that happened at least once during their life was the uh, hearing of the loud buzzing uh, drones, the Israeli drones that keep buzzing in the skies. 90.8% of the women reported hearing the uh, loud and buzzing noise. I remember a few years ago, I was interviewed by BBC4, and it was, I think, uh, uh, there. And it was interesting that the reporter was all the time registering, recording the sound of the drones. And, you know, the more calm the area is, the more louder the noise comes. And that's clearly something that you are disturbed to hear, especially in the uh, late evenings and during the night. The second most frequent, and this is really a huge figure, I think it's, it's very uh, uh, massive. It's the uh, uh, hearing of a residential area that was bombarded. You know, that the, resi the residential area that they lived in has been bombarded by Israeli forces. That's 91.2%. Movement restrictions between Gaza Strip and West Bank and East Jerusalem, and that affected 83.3 percent of the uh, women. Difficulties in providing the requirements and needs of a decent life for themselves and their families, 82 you percent. Know, the, the notion of whether I am capable of providing a decent life to my family or my uh, uh, or, or for myself is 82.7 percent. 35% of women experienced loss of a family member due to the Israeli attack on Gaza, and 31% were injured during an Israeli attack on Gaza. These figures are really uh, high. 70% were unable to access the vital medical care they needed due to the restrictions on the freedom of movement. 37% lost a sick family member who had not received their medical exit permit in a timely manner. Now. These figures are really uh, huge, but uh, I'm not sure if I could share the screen. Uh, oh, oh, okay, not yet. So, uh, Joseph, could you please uh, allow me to share screen? Uh, the the uh, I would like just to show one uh, one uh, simple. Uh, okay, you, yeah. oh, thank you very much. I would like just to show one simple uh, uh, slide, and I hope that you can see it uh, clearly. This is the, the Gaza Strip, you know, from the very northern to the very southern area, the very eastern areas. And this is a small geographical area, 35, 40 kilometers in length and about uh, 8 to 14 kilometers in width. You look at the blue circles, and these are health facilities. The more blue circles, the more inhabitants, the more populated areas. You look at also at uh, red, look at green, look at yellow squares, little squares. Now those green, little, red, and yellow squares, they represent the areas that were attacked in May 2021. This is uh, a, a map that was made by UNITAR, one of the UN agencies, after the May 2021 attacks. Now, these areas, you know, the more you see, you notice the more blue circles, the more attacks, you know, which means that the highly dense area with population were, uh, were attacked. And at the same time, uh, the very eastern sites where most of our clinics took place, whether in East Hanunas or in the south or in the very northern area or the eastern side of Gaza Strip, were extremely or heavily uh, attacked. That's why the uh, feeling that night, the reporting that 90% uh, lived in an area that was bombed during, uh, at least once during the last time. The, uh, what does that mean? You know, th these places are simply uh, devoid. I mean, we don't have shelters by the meaning a place that you can hide in. This is all to everyone. And it means that you continuously have the fear of being attacked. 55 to 75% of the people who were killed or wounded during all the attacks or different attacks were reported by international human rights organizations of being just civilians, you know, who were killed or wounded. So there is a huge sense of lack of safety that you can be that you can get killed at any moment. In 2014, 80, 80, that's eight zero families were erased from the public records, you know, the whole families. My own family, 27 people got killed in one attack. Those people got killed. Sorry about that. My mobile phone is on. Mute, but this is someone else. 
the right form. So uh, imagine that, that uh, uh, 27 people got killed at the same time, including uh, three pregnant women, including 17 children. Just one attack that 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 was the end of of twenty seven people. So uh, that really explained that the massive uh, exposure to being exposed to the possibility or the chance of getting killed because of a, 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 an attack. Now the question is about the prevalence of mental health problems among participants, and there are different uh, studies that came up recently and in the last couple of years. Uh, the prevalence of psychological distress. The prevalence of psychological distress, uh, which includes anxiety and depression, is around 64.89%. 64.89% among those women. 47.6% had severe psychological distress. We used a screening tool, that's the PHQ-4, and we looked more into the potential you know, cases for depression. Out of the women, 71.2% had the potential of becoming, I mean, uh, the potential uh, case of uh, being depressed. 80.9% had the potential case uh, of becoming an anxiety, a case that has an anxiety disorder. Now, the main predictors for mental health, we looked into nine predictors of mental health. The most uh, uh, involved ones, the most related, the most important predictors for, of mental health for those women, was first the violations towards the right of life, and the second was the right to uh, health. So these were the main two predictors. Um, of course, there were some other predictors that we looked into, uh, but, but these were the, the, the main ones. Then comes the uh, uh, violations to the right of movement, violations to the right of level, liberty, the violations uh, towards the right to human treatment, and violations to uh, the right to express opinion, the relations to the right to health, and the relation to the right of, uh, uh, well, there were a couple of, of issues that were not relevant, but I think that the main findings show that the main two predictors of mental health were violations to the right of life and violations to the right of health. So these are the main findings that came out of the, of the studies. Uh, the restriction of movement of patients who are in need uh, to receive treatment in the uh, West Bank or in Jerusalem in Palestinian hospitals is still a big concern. Uh, the, uh, Israel has a, a, a well-known record of block blocking patients, cancer patients, patients with severe uh, health illnesses from reaching the uh, treatment places in, uh, in, uh, in West Bank or in, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, unfortunately, many of the cases, I think 40% of the cases reach the hospitals without a companion because their companions were not allowed or their applications were uh, delayed. In the last uh, two weeks ago, one of my colleagues, she is a medical secretary that works at one of our community centers. She called me weeping in the morning around like 7.30 a.m. She said, look, my husband, who is a cancer patient, you know, he has to go today to a Makassar hospital or a Mokala hospital in East Jerusalem. He got the permit. Unfortunately, I didn't get the permit. She is in her early 50s. He is in his late 60s. And already he was affected by the, uh, uh, by the cancer. And she said, I'm not sure how he's going to be able to go to spend two days in Jerusalem and come back. We made several contacts with several human rights organizations. We were promised that maybe the next time she will be able to accompany him. That promise is given to tens of thousands of people, you know. The records are available on the WHO website, on Physicians for Human Rights website, on the Senior Center for Human Rights website, on the Mizan Center for Human Rights website. And there is a need to really uh, uh, intervene. Perhaps the biggest need is to just respect uh, the rights of humans, you know, put an end to the violations of human rights uh, violations. And with that, I, I, I get back to Dana for uh, uh, the next uh, uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasser. That's quite alarming. Um, going through 
you know, the, some of the issues around people being ill and, um, you know, that they're not being able to be accompanied, get the treatment they want, all of the things in normal life that, that people have to deal with. And then against the backdrop of all the horror of people being killed and so on and so forth. Very, very graphic. Thank you very much. I think Donna wants to come back in before I open it up to questions. So if people could please indicate if they want to ask a question. Thank you, Donna. Sure. So I think that, uh, I th thank you, uh, Dr. Abujama, for that, uh, for the input. I think, um, you know, uh, we want to make sure that when we speak about Gaza, we don't speak about it separately, uh, but as part of um, Israel's regime of apartheid that it imposes on the occupied Palestinian territory. And I think that when we speak about uh, Palestinian mental health, um, you know, there are various elements that we need to draw in. So obviously when it comes to Gaza, we're talking about the impact of the blockade, about you know, regular military assaults, about the, the you know, uh, mental health cost of journeys of oncology patients, minors, those who need to access uh, medical care uh, in other parts of the Palestinian healthcare system, such as East Jerusalem. But when we speak about the West Bank, you know, we need to look at you know, forcible home invasions, Oh, you know, home demolitions, et cetera. And when we speak about within Israel, we need to look at you know, the, the mental health impact of the Nakba. Uh, we just you know, marked 75 years of the Nakba and we're talking about an ongoing um, trauma that has resulted uh, from that. And you know, when we speak of mental health in general, we need to remember that here, you know, the mental health is, is not, a, you know, it's not, it doesn't require more medications or you know, better programming. Of course, you know, that as well. But what is really required is a response that is political more than a response that is humanitarian. And I think here we need to emphasize the need for accountability for Israeli uh, human rights violations. Um, and of course, you know, we need to um, bear in mind um, the, the need to bring Israeli policies in line with UN resolution 1325. We're talking about you know, protecting the mental health uh, and the well-being of Palestinian women, but also Palestinians in general. I think that's sort of the last point I want to make before opening it up to, to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Does anybody want to come in at this point? No. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about, about this is that um, from from the West point of view, we don't see Gaza. You know, we're not allowed in. We haven't been allowed in now for many years. And people like myself and the people on this call don't forget about it, obviously, because we do so much work around it. But I think for the general population and the general population of people in the political world, actually, it's, it's unseen. Um, and that's one of the problems. How do we get, what can we do? And I think your report will be helpful in this to make people sort of be aware of what's going on, that things are bad enough in all of the occupied territories, but in Gaza, you've got these added things, the blockade or the impact of the blockade and you know much more violence and aggression from Israel. Um, I mean, have you have you in your, your report done any contrasting of the lives of Palestinian people outside of Gaza to the, is there a high instance of mental health problems within the Gaza Strip? Well, you know, uh, this is a very important question. And I'll give you a very uh, clear example of how things are, you know. Uh, we were like living throughout the blockade for many years now, it's already 15 years. And one of the things that happened during COVID-19 when the restriction on, on movement became global with, with uh, uh, distancing, you know, and with not allowing people to move around, a lot of our colleagues, a lot of our friends who are in the, in the international community started telling us that now we feel what does it mean to live under blockade, you know, because in a sense, they were not able to travel to visit their relatives, to, live, to, to, to visit different countries, different places. They just had a moment when they're uh, freedom of movement was not there as the as it used to be. Uh, th they said even some of them were like you know mental health professionals. Now we really feel what does it mean. Uh, I have a very uh, good friend who followed the Palestinian people for more than three decades. Actually, he is a clinical psychologist and he writes. He have written a lot of papers about the Gaza Strip. 
uh, a few years ago, just a few months before the COVID-19 started. You know, we, we experience every now and then, it's not only the ones that you hear in the media, I mean, the bombardment, the assaults, the offensives, the large, large scale operations, but every sometimes every second or third week you hear a bombardment here or there. You don't know what's the reason or what's happening. You just hear a couple of loud explosions at like one or two a.m. and that's it, you know. And then they you will hear that they were just like you know they 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 just hit uh, uh, whatever point that Hamas has or Jihad has or whoever has you. Know, but but it's a large explosive sound that occurs in the middle of the night after the, the middle of the night. Anyway, and sometimes that happens at the seaside. They, they just do that at the seaside. So we had one of those nights that the bombardment continued like for a few hours. And by a chance, that colleague was just sitting or, or sleeping actually at, uh, in his uh, place uh, in a building that's not far from the seaside in Gaza City. And it was his first time, although he used to come and go and come and go for three decades, that the bombardment happened when he was in Gaza, you know. And of course, he he just jumped like any Gazan person to out of his bed. He ran into the stairs and then downstairs to the bottom floor just to seek refuge there because there is no shelters, actually. He spent there like a couple of hours and by the dawn, you know, he went back to his room. He said, I have written about that tens of times, you know, but I have never had a feeling until I had experienced it my, my, myself, you know. It's, it's such really, uh, uh, we, we, first of all, as a, as a Palestinian, as a Gazan, I really don't hope that anyone will experience the, the kind of uh, violations, human rights violations that we, we have. It's really beyond imagination what we are exposed uh, to. By a chance, I was in the UK during one of the, I mean, last five or six years, and uh, I saw an event that was published or advertised by a group of justice students, Justice for Palestine. And I went there to attend. I was just a very ordinary person. I was not giving a talk or not doing anything. And then there was three young uh, students, actually, I think one boy and two women. And they were talking about their experience walking around in West Bank. You know, They were not capable of coming to Gaza. And they were talking about how it looked like when the sewage that was coming out of the settlements on the hills were just drawing into the or coming into the Palestinian villages villages were just down the, the, the hill or in the in the valleys you know and it, it was such a to me that was something uh, interesting that those young uh, students were just capable of showing their colleagues what does it mean to be in there uh, no matter how much you speak about that as long as we are not in the media, actually, as, as long as there is nothing in there to be covered by the big media outlets, no one really knows about what happens in Gaza. The people feel and think that things are regular, feel things are uh, on the right track, that nothing is happening. Why we are clearly uh, living under continuous development, as Teraro explains it. Or now, as a group of UCL uh, colleagues, talk about slow violence, that we are exposed to slow violence over the years, you know. And let me just give you, give you a couple of, of figures. I'm sure that you know them, but let's keep them in mind. Poverty rate is more than 50%. We have 48% of the population in Gaza Strip children. That's more than 1 million children. Imagine more than half a million children in this population live under poverty line. Imagine that unemployment rate is more than 46% in a place that has the highest literacy rate in the Middle East with the highest number of people with bachelor, master, and PhD degrees. So to make the it- The contrasts short, are horrendous. To the, to the, uh, you have made a very excellent suggestion. I think we will take that into consideration, uh, consideration if we can just draw a comparison between what's life in Gaza and what's life uh, could be in a, in a regular place. We have a lot of narratives, by the way, a lot of stories that were told by, by, by women, and we will show them all in the report. Thank you. We've got a couple of people want to ask questions now. Joseph, can I bring you in first, please? Sure. Um, thanks. Thank you both very much for your you know, wonderful um, contributions. Um, just sort of wondering what, what sort of recommendations would 
would both of you have from you know fairly quite differing perspectives in a way uh, in terms of two policymakers in the UK, obviously in, in you know parliamentarians and also EU colleagues. We have an MEP on the call as well. And um, what recommendations there? And also, I suppose, um, what can be done in terms of say the UK mental health community in terms of whether it be solidarity actions or actions there, and how how can we join up some of those parts i think to um to either get better awareness and or, or you know or actually take sort of policy action um, sure um so regarding you know what's um you know what uh can be done you know for the parliamentary parliamentarian perspective you know i think that um as as was mentioned here you know we're talking about a very invisible crisis which sort of part of the invisibility of Gaza in general. And I think here the question is, how do you make it visible? And I think we need to mainstream the conversation on mental health in Gaza into other conversations on mental health. Um, and I think, you know, um, that's one aspect. So when we speak also about you know, the medical, getting the medical community or the mental health community uh, in the UK involved, it's, you know, reaching, you know, people here reaching out to the all party uh, group on mental health. Um, and you're sharing the findings with them. Uh, we're talking about uh, standard setting um, and ensuring conversations about this in the British Medical Association, um, the Royal College of Psychiatr Psychiatrists, et cetera. So I think, you know, ensuring that these conversations are happening is, is one element. But as I mentioned, you know, um, supporting pro accountability, we're talking about supporting processes in the ICC, um, but also, um, you know, supporting. Um, any sort of um, uh, accountability in general, um, you know, for for Israeli human rights violations. And uh, Julie, you mentioned uh, a comparison between the West Bank and Gaza, and I think that's very accurate. And I think also, you know, what we at PHR have been working on is also a comparison uh, in terms of you know, uh, we have two health systems, right? One, the Palestinian health system, and the Israeli health system, and you know, we have very very different health uh, system uh, indicators, you know, whether it's your know, number of beds um, and then uh, number of doctors, nurses, number of, you know, x-ray machines, and then therefore very different health indices. So if we compare, you know, child mortality between the OPT and Israel, we see child mortality in the OPT, and that's taking the West Bank and Gaza together is, you know, four times as high as that of Israel, which, you know, and for us, um, you know, a large part of the reason why this situation is the way it is uh, results from Israel's, you know, almost total control over every aspect of Palestinian life. And here we're talking about Israel's, you know, uh, policies that have been resulted in the de-development of the Palestinian health system, whether it's, you know, land expropriation, fiscal, you know, tax freeze, etc. Um, and therefore, it sort of contributes to our analysis of two different health system, two different health outcomes under the responsibility of the Israeli authorities, which leads us to conclude that this is a situation of apartheid in health, whether we're talking about the West Bank or Gaza. So just sort of adding that uh, element into that discussion. And I'll let Yasser take it from here. Yeah, I think the, uh, in, in one aspect, uh, at the professional level, people who work in mental health, we have a, a strong solidarity groups. The UK Palestine Mental Health Network, we have quite few members here. I don't know, Sahran, they are present here. They are doing really great in terms of supporting that uh, the work that we are doing. Uh, however, we need to ensure the freedom of speech. The freedom of speech is a big issue in the third world countries, but unfortunately, it's becoming also another issue in the countries like the United States or the United Kingdom. I mean, people have the right to talk about what they feel. People have to, I mean, I mean, Palestinians are regular human beings that they are entitled, entitled to live in dignity, entitled to live in peace, entitled, entitled to live in justice, entitled to be uh, in control of their own resources, entitled basically to be free of the occupation. Uh, we are not Ukrainians, of course, but we are also entitled to the same steps that were made in by, by, by Western governments it comes to what happened between Russia and Ukraine. You know? I mean, it's it's the same. International uh, humanitarian laws, the human rights uh, declarations, we have more than 
I don't know how many of those human rights declarations. Uh, they should apply. They should apply to Palestinians. They should apply to Israelis. They should apply to everyone globally. You know. So, so we hope that that, that will be the uh, uh, the case. Uh, a lot of uh, media outlets, uh, young people, more young people are really they they more know what's really happening because of social media outlets, let me say, you know, and that have made a big change. I think and I feel that there is a, a strong movement and more people are understanding really what's happening in Palestine. It's not anymore just the Israeli narrative. It's also there is another Palestinian narrative that is growing. And we hope that the politicians are going to uh, respond to the requests that are made by those people, especially the young ones who start to speak up about Palestinian rights, you know. We speak about students at universities, we speak about different unions, and I think they deserve the support of British MPs, of the British uh, 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 politicians, because after all, they are not speaking for anything, but for justice and for fairness. You know. Thank, Thank you, you uh, yes, sir. I'll bring Andy in next. Andy, dear. Thanks very much, yes, sir, for the... Um... Bring, bringing the focus onto the mental health of people. So I think we get too many of the statistics we hear are about the, the injuries, deaths, and on both sides. And then we get in the, the, the narrative then becomes Israel trying to defend what it's doing by saying, well, they send rockets against us and we, we're just retaliating and all that kind of nonsense. And forget that, um, I mean, I, to me, when you think of the numbers, it's just incredible. My uh, my mum was a child during the Blitz um, in World War II, and they had some quite exciting stories of, you know, a bit of bombing and a few exciting, the Battle of Britain, and it was all very, I mean, this is something that's been going on for 18 years, and, and it's just um, completely unbelievable that the Israeli people can can do this to the, to the Palestinians. And I'm just sort of thinking that maybe the narrative needs to get away from the atro atrocious um, deaths and injuries to the fact that I've got some figures written down here, 65% suffering from depression. Well, why wouldn't they be? I'm amazed the figure's so low. And uh, there are lots of other higher percentages I've written down. Maybe we ought to make people aware that, yes, the, the, the Palestinians have got right on their side and they are the decent people in this you know in this dispute or this war but they are suffering and, and it, it, it in a way it kind of I, I th how are we shying away from admitting the truth that the people of palestine are in a desperate situation and it, it and we should be making people aware that you can't be under that kind of siege for 18 years and come out of it without terrible psychological damage and just the, the fact of that I mean because I always want to get get back to how can we say to the Israeli people just just sit down and think what you're actually doing with it you know forget about all the the statistics and all the nonsense about well, they started it and we're just retaliating and just think what you're actually doing to two million people and maybe that's what we, we you know we need to anyway I just wanted to say thanks for reminding me or telling me that it's the psychological damage that's affecting everybody it's just you know just horrendous anyway i'll stop Thank, thanks andy i think i think on that i think that's more of a comment than a question but i think that's one of the things these stark numbers any one of these life events losing a family member any of those things in in the uk would have a you know a huge impact on the mental health of anyone but they're dealing with that in amongst everything else that's going on. I think it's really, it's overwhelming. Um, I'm going to bring in Gwyneth now, Gwyneth Daniel. You're very welcome, Gwyneth. Thank you, Julie. And um, thank you so much, Yes, It's great to see you. And um, thank you, Dana. Um, I'm a member of the UK Palestine Mental Health Network. And I just wanted to reinforce something that Yes, I said, and maybe add some a little bit of a different angle on it that might be something to present to um, mental health institutions here or to the Mental Health Committee. 
which is the relationship between depression and powerlessness, which we know from long established research in this country and elsewhere, that feelings of impotence, powerlessness and depression and suicidality are so closely linked. And the incredible um, imbalance of power that exists in between um, Israel and Palestine and particularly in Gaza. And Yasser and Dana have, um, you've both alluded to this in different ways, having so much of your life totally under the control of the occupying power for women in particular, but also for men, not being able to protect your children. So the people we talk to in Gaza say that one of the most painful things is being terrified and trying to, <clears throat> to, to protect your children from their fear and anxiety and not being able to do it. So I think those things need to be emphasized because they have such emotional power and um, maybe in representations to um, mental health organizations, we can, um, we can emphasize that. But I just wanted to say one other thing, which is about the impotence that all of us, I'm sure, including um, Julie and Kim, who are on the, the MPs on the call, is that at the very moment that we're talking about this, the things that we could be doing to support Palestinians are being blocked by our government. So the um, bill that particularly names Israel as a country that cannot be held to account in any way that local authorities cannot divest from, even from settlement goods. Michael Gove makes it very clear that both the occupied territories and um, the Golan Heights are included in the list of goods that cannot be boycotted. So I just wanted to kind of say, how can we, what else can we do to combat our own feelings of impotence, and also to try and um, spread the world word among those who I'm sure within Parliament must feel equally strongly about this, but are perhaps more reluctant to raise their heads above the parapet in the way that Julie and Kim have done. Thank you. Thanks. If I may just done it. Yes, thank you. Um, listen, I thank you. Um, I think this is just to answer you, Gwyneth, and thank you. That's a really good point regarding powerlessness um, and the mental health impact of powerlessness. We had a project together with two other Israeli human rights organizations, Yeshdin and um, Breaking the Silence, which investigated um, in Israel the phenomenon of possible home invasions uh, in the West Bank by the Israeli military uh, and the impact on the mental health of, you know, of children and families. Um, and that was definitely you know, one theme that came up, the idea that you, know, you can't protect your home, you can't protect your family. Um, and I think you know, it's a, it's a, when we're faced with you know, the British government or whether the Israeli, it's the Israeli government, I think you know, there, there is a feeling of, of hopelessness, but I think that you know, civil society um, you know, uh, and, and specifically targeting here the mental health community, the medical community is a good way to go about it. Um, regarding Andy's point about how do you, you reach out to Israelis, and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd you know, be um, wary of um, looking at it as a homogenous mass, you know, I'm an Israeli Jew representing an Israeli human rights organization, and I think, you know, uh, we do a lot of activity vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli public, most of our work is targeted um, at the Israeli public uh, and Israeli, you know, medical community, I won't say the Israeli government now so much because, you know, we have no hope with the current Israeli government. Um, but I think here, you know, the, the idea is you know, very coming from out from the professional mental health angle um, and bringing forward and humanizing the stories uh, of Palestinians and sort of showing with evidence, you know, what is actually happening on the ground uh, and also um, what is, you know, data wise, what is that? You know, what do these bombardments, blockade, et cetera, what do they do uh, to Palestinians living in Gaza? Uh, but also we have had work on the mental health impact of Israelis in Siderot that are 
um, also suffering. Of course, we're talking about um, a huge discrepancy. Uh, you know, Israel is you know, the occupying power, it's running an apartheid regime, but obviously, you know, we want to ensure that there's you know, um, some empathy when we speak about the individuals involved here as well. Thank you, Donna. I don't know, has anyone else got any questions? I'm noticing one or two people are having to leave, I'm afraid. It's the nature of the world we work in. Yasser, I don't know whether you want to come back on anything that's been said. Yeah, I think uh, let's keep in mind that uh, although the conditions are deteriorating, although the offensives continue to happen now, now once yearly at least, but people are surviving, people are struggling, and I think we are winning the battle against the uh, I mean, we are surviving. Sometimes just to stay alive is winning a battle itself, you know. And uh, we send a clear message to everyone who comes to Gaza and sees and visits the houses in Gaza, even the partially destroyed ones. Everyone who comes see that there is a big struggle and that we are winning this struggle, that the kids go to schools, that we continue to invest in education, that we continue to care about our own society, that we are still hopeful despite all the difficulties that maybe one day it will be, life will be easier, will be better, you know. So, uh, and then there is a lot of positive uh, energy that comes from young people globally, by the way. Those ones who really follow the media, uh, the social media and see the, both stories, if I could say, both narratives, if I could say. And then, um, so if, if the current conditions are like letting us down, we should not let them uh, put us down. I mean, we, we need to keep our spirits high and we need to uh, uh, put more efforts into this uh, case. And uh, that's how things are, you know, nothing is really easy in any place in the, on the globe for any case, you know, you cannot win anything easily. Look at the uh, weather issues, you know, the climate change. Uh, are we winning in that fight to have a better issues regarding climate change? No, we are not. I mean, so that uh, the Palestinian case should not this let us down. We need to continue our struggle and we will win. At the end of the day, you know, it doesn't matter how long it will take. At the end of the day, Palestinian people will receive their justice. They will receive their freedom. Uh, that's it. It's very simple. No occupation, the man history continued forever. It ended at a certain point. And this occupation is going to end. We are going to get our lights. Uh, so uh, we need to keep our spirits up. We need to do our best to achieve that as soon as possible. Thank you. We've got, sorry, Diana. Sorry. Yes, I, I just want to you know, strengthen Yasser's uh, uh, point, you know, as obviously as, as someone who, who leads the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, um, I think this is a very important important is sort of the standard setting that we should follow. Um, and this is something, this resilience, um, a year of resilience was very much, you know, echoed um, in the response of, uh, of Palestinian women um, during this research project. So, you know, obviously, you know, the women who we interviewed testified to the difficulties that resulted from an ongoing exposure to human rights violations. But alongside great distress, you know, these women were also able to develop very productive coping strategies, you know, whether it's use of humor, religious support, um, you know, a way of adapting to a very impossible situation um, with, with a lot of courage. And I think we need to, um, to bear that in mind and sort of strengthen that point. We have two more people who want to ask questions. So I'm going to bring them both in and then if you can answer sort of both of the questions at once, if that makes sense. So first, my colleague here in Westminster, Kim Johnson. Kim. Thanks so much, Julie, and thank you so much for Yasa and Donna. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Um, I just wanted a question. Um, I have a question in regard regarding children, young people, and mental health, because we know that lots of young children are detained in military prisons. So I wanted to know whether there been any research investigation on that and we know that during conflict situations we know that women are subject to horrendous you know violence you know sexual violence and whether again this has been reported and investigated thank you both thanks kim i'll bring in andy as well now and then sorry julia all i wanted to do was say to, to dana uh, please don't think I was blaming all Israelis for what's going on in um, Gaza and the, and the West Bank. Of course, I know obviously that there, there are many um, very decent people. It's just unfortunate that the, the 
the electoral system seems to have delivered a very right wing government as it has in this country, in fact, actually, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, I know it doesn't represent all of you. But I just wanted to make a statement, not ask no, a question. No, no, of course, I, I didn't take it in that way. Um, uh, I'll respond primarily to the question on, um, on uh, the incarceration and detention of, of minors, which, you know, Israel has mass incarceration of Palestinians. It's part and parcel of Israel's strategy to silence uh, dissent and opposition. Uh, this is something that we at PHRI are closely, uh, closely tracking. Um, and, you know, um, uh, there are a few organizations that work specifically on minors. Um, uh, but of course, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's no way to not be, you know, the average uh, individual in incarceration is impacted by psychologically by being in incarceration, all the more so when you're denied due process, when you're a minor, when you're, when you're deprived of the presence of your parents during interrogation, when you are uh, taken in the middle of the night from your home in the West Bank and dragged uh, for interrogation uh, and you're 14, 13, 12, nine years old. Um, so completely agree that this is a huge issue, and you know I'm I'm glad that the UK has a lot of emphasis on you know the field of you know, children in um, in armed conflicts or in situations of occupation, um, and uh, and yes, that's something that that continues that needs to be highlighted. In terms of our research on on children, it's been primarily through you know forcible home invasions, where we saw you know from reports of the parents that their children was uh, after uh, um, after the military raid on their home. You know, the children were afraid to um, leave their parents. So, you know, from, from the people that we interviewed, you know, one family spoke about how their child sort of refused to go to school, uh, returned to bedwetting, including with older children, um, suicidal ideation. Um, and, you know, this is uh, in the West Bank where the situation is, you know, arguably, I don't, I don't think you can say better than, than Gaza, but definitely there's no aerial bombardment that is consistent, not the same exact situation of, uh, of blockade, but of course, oppression uh, is throughout the OPT uh, and for Palestinians within Israel. I have to say, have it, having visited uh, uh, the occupied territories in 2017, visiting the military courts was the most harrowing experience uh, of the whole trip, seeing children um, in chains. I, I found it just quite difficult to deal with, I have to say. Um, I don't know whether, Yasser, you want to say anything else? Yeah, I think regarding this issue, the story of Ahmed Manasra is very vibrant about that. It, it gives a clear explanation of a child who was put into jail when he was 12, interrogated when he was 12, and now he's 21 or 22, uh, suffering severe mental illness. And that's already registered, that's already known, and he's still under like uh, uh, isolated, he's in an isolated cell as far as I know. You know? So, so there are many such uh, uh, stories. And you know, Palestinian children are entitled again, like all children in the world to live a, a life when they can enjoy playing with toys, you know, when they can enjoy having a good night's sleep, when they are enjoying living in peace, uh, having a very nice, uh, uh, soft hug of their moms and daddies and going to sleep without the fear that something will happen in the night. That's not the case, unfortunately, for Palestinian children. Nadira Kivorkia and Shalhu, she is one of my friends and a very known psychologist who have written about a term that she calls unchilding, you know, which means that children are like, you know, stripped from their childhood when they grow under occupation, when they are exposed uh, uh, on, expo exposed on daily basis to the human rights violations, and that's something that worth to to read and to uh, to go into. Um, and finally, I mean, there are many things that could be done, but any little thing that anyone can do is very important. You know, we do not need to change the world in one night. It doesn't work like that. So any small little thing, you know, little by little, we can change things, you know. So no matter how much you can help and you think that maybe it's a little idea, it wouldn't make a big change. No, everything makes sense. Everything makes a change. If that change is a small one, fine. We can build on it later. And Palestinian people, we really know and we appreciate all the help and support for, that comes from different places in the world. We really know we are the most educated people and uh, social media brings all the news to us 
and we all the time salute and talk about people who support our course. And we have many, many, many heroes, uh, even in the UK, the country that given our land, you know, by a mistake to, 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 to you know, uh, and the battle for the creation, et cetera, et cetera. Even in the UK, we have many heroes, and we have many heroes to Palestine. So, so please continue the support to the Palestinian people. It's lovely hearing your positivity, Yasser. Um, it's a, it's, it says something about the human spirit that you can be so positive when dealing with such awfulness around you. Um, but we really appreciate it. Well, that brings our hour to an end to bring our, um, our meeting to a close. Can I thank you very much on behalf of everyone who has attended? And you'll see in the comments everyone who's left as well. That's been really interesting. Um, and, and very enlightening. Um, and I look forward to reading the report when the full report is published. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining and for Kabu and for you, Julie, for, for putting this on. Bye bye.